Hello students, in this lab we're going to discuss energy, electricity, and sustainability. The learning outcome we are focused on is to compare and contrast conventional and sustainable energy resources. By the end of this lab, students should be able to answer the following questions about energy, electricity, and sustainable sources of energy. What is energy? What is electricity? And what makes energy sustainable? So I recently went to California with my family, and as we approached LA, we got really lots to see in a plane, but I'll just talk about this one thing this time. Um, we saw this huge solar farm. So here's my plane wing in this picture, and you see those black panels down in here, um, and you can see the clouds and the shadows they make. And then behind this row of clouds, there are these two strange structures. It was like the ground was spray painted blue, and then we couldn't tell if these were like flares or if they were huge reflections. We couldn't tell what it was, but these are huge solar arrays. So let's zoom in there. Okay, so just to give you a landscape perspective, <laughs> um, this, I don't think this picture would even show a car. Um, you can vaguely make out a road here, but this is massive, massive um, solar farm east of LA in California. So interesting, we will look at solar energy in this lab. Okay, so there's a lot going on here. Um, the theme is what is energy, electricity, and what makes energy sustainable. And sustainability is a choice. So as I was making this lab, I made way too many parts to it. And I started to really think about how you know, we could adopt this idea that sustainability is a choice because you can choose the components of this lab you want to complete to reach the certain number of points required for one lab, which is 30 points. Um, that being said, you have to do the main experiential lab component, which is to build a solar oven. Um, but to round out your learning experience, you can choose at least two of these activities and you may do extra ones because you know as we've been discussing this is my first time teaching environmental science online for Colorado Mountain College I did not make the field trip required and I want to create opportunities for people to cre uh, gather points for the unit 5 lab without feeling forced to go on a field trip, although I do really hope as many people can make it as can feasibly make it. So choose at least two of these activities. Um, there's an energy types worksheet. Now let me just pause for one second and say that which activity should you choose? You should base this on where you're entering your, what's your knowledge level as you enter this lab. So if you've never taken a physics class and you don't know anything about how energy works, you probably want to do the activities that will appear in this list first. If you feel pretty confident with that or you're more interested in like the applied aspects of sustainable energy, then do the latter activities. So the first is energy types worksheets. I'll show you these in more detail. Um, there are uh, FET simulations from CU Boulder that you can complete. You can do some research on your own, um, similar to like the PFA's research we did in a previous lab. And um, you can also do some math, calculating energy efficient, efficiency in your own home. Finally, if you really are interested in the economics of sustainability, you can do an exercise where you look at the positive and negative externalities associated with each form of renewable energy. Okay, so here we go. What is energy in its fundamental form? So thinking back um, to early physics, which is taught as early as elementary school um, with a spiraling new curriculum in the um, next generation standards. So potential energy is energy that's stored for later use. It's the energy of position. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. 
So most classically in a classroom prior to this one, you may have, you know, dropped a book from your desk and thought about potential and kinetic energy. When an object is raised above the ground level, it has potential energy due um, to its position. Uh, you can also have potential energy in bonds. So bonds essentially are shared electron relationships um, that really are stored energy. When those bonds break, that energy is released. So you can complete this worksheet to explore the 10 main types of energy uh, put to use in our modern human world. Energy types worksheet gets you more practice in understanding the energy transformations in your everyday life. Oh, sorry about this. Going to open the worksheet. Okay, here's the worksheet. So interestingly, you know, we had a in our discussion early in the course about academic resources and academic integrity. And <laughs> this worksheet I have found cited by dozens of different people, and there is no original reference for it. I have no idea what the original reference is. I just chose a reference. However, since it is an artifact, a cultural scientific artifact of teaching science, I figured we could just join the bandwagon. Um, so in exercise one, you consider lots of different forms of energy that you might use in your home. We are going to dial those down to kinetic and potential energy. So all of these different forms can really be digested as potential or kinetic energy. And then we look at some different examples. And moving right along, you can fill in this worksheet and submit it as part of your points here. Okay, so this is just a way to really wrap your mind around the simplest concepts um, upon which sustainable energy is built. Now, moving right along in the natural thought progression, once we have an understanding of what energy is on the planet, we ask ourselves, what is electricity? And electricity is a form of energy resulting from the existence of charged particles. So I talked before about how electrons in chemical bonds represent a form of potential energy. Um, and electrons are, for example, um, little packets of energy similar to the photons from which all energy on Earth derives cell from the sun itself. So when photons, which can be uh, represented as packets or waves in physics, when they strike a leaf surface, they excite the electrons in the um, chloroplast molecule. And the electrons literally jump to higher uh, valence energy, valence slash energy levels. Um, and they, impart, they, they gain more energy from these photons striking them. And then they use that energy to create ATP and assemble um, glucose sugar molecules, which then get broken down um, in cellular respiration processes where energy is released through kinetic processes, processes of movement. So when we look at electricity, we can think of it as being static and or dynamic. Um, and we can play with that electricity. So static electricity can easily be demonstrated with a balloon. So let's take that. Okay, so here we're looking at PBS parents. This is just the best article I could find with great pictures. Um, but again, this is kind of a cultural scientific artifact. The salt and pepper static electricity balloon science activity. No one owns this. It just lives in the world of teaching. Um, so essentially you blow up a balloon, you rub it to your hair, um, your hair and the balloon interact and electrons are transferred. Then when you put salt and pepper on a plate and you hold the balloon above the salt and pepper plate, 
you can see that without actual physical contact, contact, the balloon can pull the salt and pepper right off the plate and defy gravity. How does that happen? Well, opposites attract. The differential charges between the balloon surface and these tiny low mass particles of salt and pepper is strong enough to overcome the forces of gravity. So there you have it, static electricity. Now when we're thinking about uh, electricity as a current, as a dynamic process, this can be modeled using the FET simulations coming out of CU Boulder. So let's go take a look at those. Okay, so this is an amazing open source resource um, right here in Colorado, serving the world with science knowledge. So essentially you can see all these categories. There might be other things that you want to look up later, so definitely bookmark this site. But what I have for you right here is the page about electricity, magnets, and circuits. Um, so when you click on these images, you get to an interactive platform where you can engage with the material. Let's see here. All right. Okay, so we just saw how you manipulate the measurements and essentially in that particular uh, simulation, you can develop electrostatic potential based on where you put the lines and the charges. And this kind of shows you what's going on inside of the um, balloon salt and pepper demo from a physics perspective. Um, so when you go through those simulations, you can complete up to five of them for one point each and just mess around with it and write three sentences describing what happened in each one. Um, and then that is a choice you can make. Moving right along. After we understand how energy and electricity work, we want to kind of understand what makes energy sustainable because that is really the topic at hand here in environmental science. We're not in a physics class or a class about electricity or even a class about um, chemistry would get us a lot more knowledge about how electrons work. But we really are talking about the applications. And so what makes energy sustainable? Well, to burst your bubble, nothing. Energy is energy. Energy, electricity is electricity. In other words, the principles of physics and chemistry inherent to energy and electricity are exactly the same no matter what the fuel source is. So the sustainability piece is about where the energy comes from before it is converted to electricity. Some energy sources are sustainable, and we will call them renewable, and some are non-renewable. So if you want to get a little background about um, renewable energy and its potential to fuel the world, we can look at this article from the Wharton School. Okay, so here we are at this article. Um, so this article really throws out a lot of facts about um, how much renewable energy is relied upon in different countries of the world. Um, notice that the United States is not doing great. We're not at the top of the list. Um, but after you interact with this resource, I want you to ask yourself, um, how, has, how have these statistics changed? Um, this article is from 2015. Um, so we're four years out. How has politics, environmental concerns, how have these kinds of other um, tangential societal issues changed the perspective possibly on renewable energy use in these various countries? Um, so you can take a small perspective or a big perspective. 
So this article is five years old. Find updated statistics for at least one country. Um, so when I say big perspective or small perspective, you can just ask yourself a question even about one town um, or one county or one state or one country. Um, you could talk about politic, global politics, whether um, the world at large is trending towards the use of renewable energy or if we're kind of backpedaling a bit. Um, so just really reflect on how you think the world has changed since 2015. Okay, so now here we are, finally at the lab. Um, let's build a solar oven. So I started the lab by showing you the um, solar farm uh, on the very first slide that I flew over on my way to California. So we're going to do something very similar, but on a much smaller scale. Um, and so we are going to build a solar oven. Um, we're going to follow the instructor in, in this Scientific American article, um, but I did find a video. I cannot verify the academic quality of this reference, but I can tell you that this YouTube video follows the exact same construction procedures that are um, followed in the Scientific American article. So <clears throat> I just wanted to take a note that when reading the reference, you know, it really tells you that it has to be a warm day, um, but we don't live in a warm climate in February, March. So essentially, I want you to do this out in the snow, right? So we have plenty of solar radiation. We're much closer to the sun than most of our low-lying um, neighbors in coastal states, um, but it's not warm, so don't worry about that. Just proceed as usual um, and trust that our proximity to the sun will overcome the temperature deficits. Okay, so we're going to build a pizza box solar oven. Um, and of course, this is a really simple construction, but the basic principles could be used to build a passive oven in or on or near your earth ship wherever it may be someday in the future um so basically many there's so much more energy striking the earth's surface than we even need um even to fuel our highly consumptive society so we're just going to show that even the small area of a pizza box is enough to um, capture a significant amount of energy which will be represented as heat here in our well insulated box um, and I urge you to cook a s'more or heat up some pizza whatever works for you if you don't like to get fancy you could simply put water in a plastic container measure the temperature of the water when you put it in and measure the temperature of the water when you take it out um, here is a quick visual on how this works you are going to take a box i would assume that you're going to use a cardboard box i've never seen one of these paper boxes in colorado before but you're not all in colorado um going to line it with tin foil you're going to need a piece of black construction paper but of course anything black would work could be just a piece of dark fabric an old t-shirt um and some plastic wrap going to measure out the edges so you have a about one inch border um, you're going to cut out the center flap this is going to be your window the passive solar catcher you could use that flap lay it into the bottom to um you know oh sorry you're not going to use that you're going to keep that on there <laughs> Now you're going to uh, add reflective materials. Now we're beginning the process of insulating. Again, if you wanted to get fancy and you were using wood, you could use a plexiglass window. All depends on how serious you are about having a solar oven for the future. This solar oven isn't going to last you too long.
Okay, so under this piece of tin foil, you know, you could really have multiple layers above or below it. You could insulate the whole entire box um, on the outside. I've done other labs with students where um, they build like insulation suits basically for little stick men we make out of straws. <laughs> and uh, we just experiment with materials. And this is where you can really have fun with your recycling bins. Um, there's lots of materials that can potentially be used that you are just recycling and they're leaving your life. But when my New Year's resolution this year was to keep all of the plastic wear and um, reusable but not permanent refuse I create in my everyday life and put it to work in my garden or in artistic ways. Okay. So this part of building the solar oven is the mandatory part of the lab, and I want you to write a lab report about your solar, solar oven building experience following the rubric you are familiar with now. Um, and the recording and the record, the re measurements that you can use for your graph creation um, could be that simplistic uh, recording of a vessel of water, the initial temperature and the final temperature. Um, along with those measurements, you could collect the ambient temperature. So if you did it on multiple days and say one day it was 60 degrees out um, and the then you measured the initial and final temperature of the water and then on the next day it was only 20 degrees out, initial final temperature of the water over, you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 60 minutes, however long you want to do it. The longer the better um, to see a real reaction there. So remember, you want to be measuring something. The point of doing the graphs really is to give you the skills to make the graphs. It's not about what exactly you're doing, it's just about becoming more familiar with the idea that there are variables and they're interacting with each other and we can represent that visually with the model we call a graph. Okay, so Another activity that we can look at with the real applied science is to calculate energy efficiency. So I'm going to task you with cooking meal two or three ways. You don't actually have to cook it. You're going to cook it on paper with math. So <laughs> what is the most energy efficient way? And what really got me thinking on this is I was having a conversation with one of my colleagues here at UCCS who works in the nutrition um, department. And he was talking about how the inst I've got an Instapot and I've been using it and it cooks things so quickly and he was saying that that's so much more energy efficient and even using the microwave. But from a nutritional perspective, the, um, the fewer minutes you can cook something, the more nutrition it retains. Um, so if you boil a vegetable, for example, it retains like 30 to 40 percent of the nutrients, he said. But if you use cook it in the Instapot, or the microwave it retains 80 to 90 percent of the nutrients. Um, so I really was thinking about this while we were learning about renewable energy. And here we go. You can choose any of these cooking methods you might have at home, or maybe you work in a restaurant and you just want to know how much it costs to run like a commercial size oven. I don't know. The sticker will be on it, and you'll be able to figure it out. So you're going to calculate the electricity cost for two cooking methods. You're going to fill out the table, and um, the next slide will help. I made this all for you in Excel, okay? So there, you are going to have to do some unit conversions. So to get to the unit of hour, because electricity is measured in kilowatt hours, but I don't assume that you would cook something in the microwave for like a whole hour, for example. My example here is cooking chili, okay? So chili, it would just be 25 minutes divided by 60 minutes or 0.42 hours. Now pause the video and you do the rest, okay? Now you need to know the appliance wattage. So you're going to go look at the appliance later label or look it up on the internet. Um, and you're going to record the appliance type and brand into the table. So I looked up my Samsung microwave. It uses 1,000 watts, okay? 
Electricity is measured by the utility company in kilowatt hours. Um, and kilo, kilo is, means 1,000, so kilowatts are 1,000 times bigger than watts. So you have to divide the watts by 1,000 to convert the units. So for example, 1,000 watts divided by 1,000 is 1 kilowatt. It takes 1 kilowatt to run my microwave. Now I'm going to multiply the kilowatt hours required to cook my vegetarian chili or other meal of my choice. And finally, I'm going to find out the cost. The Colorado average rate for electricity is 9.5 cents per kilowatt hour. Submit your two calculations in the following format. So I created this whole graph in Excel, and I will put it in the lab files. Um, but here I want to talk to you about how to use Excel to build equations. And this will feed into instruction on how to use graphs, right? Because if you don't have a good table, you can't make a good graph. Um, so a couple things to remember. Um, essentially you need labels. These labels appear later as, for example, the x-axis titles or the y-axis titles, okay? Usually what's in the cell is what becomes the y-axis and these are the labels. Um, so my first sample was the Samsung microwave. Now, watts found on the appliance sticker or internet. What is wrong with this? Take a moment to appreciate this. There's something wrong with 1000W being in this cell. The problem is that if you have letters in here, then the spreadsheet program does not like see this as a number, and so it won't apply math to it. So, no, you do not want that W to be in there. Okay, I got rid of it. Now, When we look at our spreadsheet in Excel, we're going to see that we want to make an equation, okay? And the equation is going to look something like this, although I'm just in a presentation in slides right now. But when you use an equal sign, you're telling the spreadsheet program that you want to do math. And then if you tell it that you have a specific square from which you want to pull the number, this would be C2. Um, it will hold that constant when you drag the equation through uh, rows down below to pass the math along. So here we're still looking at our well-constructed spreadsheet. We have our units are noted up here and just a numeric value here. And then these are the equations that I used in this column. The cooking time, remember, was uh, there 60 minutes in an hour, and we need 25 minutes to cook the veggie chili in the microwave. 25 divided by 60 equals 0.42. Kilowatt hours to cook the meal. Multiply the appliance kilowatts by cooking time. So we had figured out over here that the microwave uses 1 kilowatt, and we used it for 0.42 hours. The answer is 0.42 hours. Er, and then we go to the electricity cost here, and we have um, that we have 0.42 kilowatt hours divided by nine and a half cents, and that means that it takes four cents to cook veggie chili in the microwave. So in this action, in this five-point activity, I want you to go through two appliances and do this math. And I created a spreadsheet where these uh, equations already exist, and you can access that in our lab materials. Okay, so the last thing is we want to think about um, the economic synthesis. So we have gone through some activities to think about how much energy we're using at home, but we want to think about um, these larger scale questions about renewable energy. So for example, in Colorado, you can pay a couple more cents per kilowatt hour to have your electricity offset by wind power. It doesn't mean that a wind turbine is gonna turn 
the electrons, you know, charge up the electrons that are going into your particular electricity, but when we look at the whole statewide budget, and in my instance, because I live in a city, Colorado Springs Utility, so in the whole municipality's budget, um, they are budgeting for a certain quantity of wind power, but it is not necessarily fueling my house. Um, but also in Colorado, since all of these forms of renewable energy do occur in, on our landscape, I wanted to really kind of take the moment to think about the positive and negatives that could be associated with these various forms of renewable so in this last five, uh, five point activity, I want you to do some research to look at the positive and the negative externalities of each. An externality in the economics is an unintended outcome of an industrial or commercial activity. It could be a positive or negative outcome. And this outcome is typically not reflected in the cost of the goods or services involved. And that is kind of how we've gotten to the conundrum that we are in, in the modern world. We do not tax pollution and therefore resource degradation um, can spiral out of control with the finger being pointed at no one and no one picking up the responsibility of solving these problems. Um, externalities can be positive, they can be negative as well. Um, so we want to think about those in a broader so social context, not just a scientific context. And that's what this table is all about. Okay, so in this lab, I've given you lots of options. You need to build a solar oven, but then look, you have five different options. Choose two of five activities to round out your um, education in unit four. If you feel that you will absolutely not be able to make it to the field trip in Unit 5, I urge you to clip, complete an extra two activities, um, and then I will afford the rest of those points through an alternate lab for that unit. Um, okay, by the end of this lab, you should be able to answer the following questions about energy, electricity, and sustainable sources of energy. What is energy? What is electricity? What makes energy sustainable? Finally, what questions remain? Contact me with your questions, discuss it in class. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this learning experience. I'm sorry the video is kind of long and I look forward to talking to you in class.